Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Sidney Porter from the History Committee of the Health Physics Society, and it's my distinct pleasure uh, this morning on January 28, 2003, to be interviewing one of the most uh, productive and influential members of the Health Physics Society, a uh, professor that's had many, many students, uh, a rare health physicist that uh, is a senior reactor operator and a PhD, a man that knows his way around nuclear power plants, uh, and a man that knows his way around the classroom, uh, and around, I think, most areas of health physics. And so uh, John Poston is going to be talking to us uh, for a while here and telling us uh, about uh, his accomplishments and uh, his uh, 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 the people that have influenced him and he's influenced uh, in the society. And uh, John, it's going to be hard to get all this into an hour and a half, but uh, welcome on the Thank you very much. Uh, Pleasure to be here. And how about telling us about uh, your early days and uh, how you uh, came to even be thinking about uh, this uh, unusual profession that you're in? <laughs> well, it's an interesting uh, chain of events. I was born in Sparta, Tennessee, which is a little town in central Tennessee, about 90 miles west of Oak Ridge. And... Uh, we traveled around in various places and ultimately settled uh, when I was in the fifth grade at, in my father's hometown, Lynchburg, Virginia. And so I f went to high school in, in the Lynchburg area and, and uh, stayed there to go to college at Lynchburg College. I uh, initially th thought I wanted to be an architectural engineer and uh, my plans were to go to Lynchburg College in their pre-engineering program and then transfer to Virginia Tech and continue my, uh, my education there and becoming an architectural engineer. Two things happened. One, uh, I met this woman who ultimately became my wife and I decided that Blacksburg, Virginia was too far away. <laughs> and uh, secondly, uh, in 1954, 55, Babcock and Wilcox established their atomic energy division and based it in Lynchburg, Virginia, and they built facilities and began to hire uh, students from Lynchburg College in, in part-time positions. And I was fortunate enough to have a position. Uh, it was perhaps an interesting story. Uh, uh, my, my classmate, Fred Haywood, asked me if I wanted a job at Babcock and Wilcox because he was employed there as a part-time technician. and I said, sure, and uh, he said, well, it's only a, a one-week job over spring break. And so I said, sure, that's fine because I was working my way through college and I was taking jobs wherever I could get them. And, and so he took me to Babcock and Wilcox and yeah. I, I immediately was introduced to a trust system that I think had a lot of influence on me for the rest of my life. Uh, the boss, we went to the boss's office and we were sitting in an outer office waiting for him to come in and and he came in and uh, Fred spoke to him and he said, he asked Fred if these are the, there were more than one of us, if we were the students that he had asked Fred to round up to help and, and Fred said yes and he said well then put them to work and uh, immediately I saw that he trusted Fred to do the job properly and, and I was infused by that uh, throughout every, everybody that I met at Babcock and Wilcox. They were, they were very qualified, they were very competent people and, and they were very trusting of each other and, and uh, put a great deal of respect for each other and so that had a big influence on me. Anyway, uh, I worked my week and on Friday afternoon uh, the boss came out and said can you work another week? And I said, sure. And the next Friday he came out and said, can you work two more weeks? And I said, sure. <laughs> and uh, then he finally came and he said, can you work till I tell you to stop? <laughs> and I said, sure. So I guess I credit part of that to my dad. My, my dad was had a rural background, but he always influenced my brother and me to give you know, a, a honest day's work for an honest day's pay, and and so uh, it that was something else I learned that if you work hard and and you give people 
more than they expect, then you can be a success. And so I went from having a one-week job to having essentially a permanent job with Babcock and Wilcox. Uh, and as a you technician. had a bachelor's degree at that point? No, I was uh, finishing my bachelor's you were degree. Just, okay, so you were still in college. So I was still in college, and, and we did, uh, Fred, and, and there were probably seven or eight students from Lynchburg College you know, majoring in physics. I was majoring in mathematics and got so interested in what was going on, I took 18 hours of physics my senior year just trying to uh, uh, to learn all I could, electricity and magnetism and atomic and nuclear physics and all of those kinds of things. Uh, so, And when I finished my degree, I went, worked full-time with Babcock and Wilcox. As and you a, also took a lot of liberal arts classes, you were saying. Oh, yes. It, uh, the, the college was a liberal arts college, and so uh, only about 25% of my courses were uh, technical in nature. I do have a BS degree as opposed to a BA, but I was required to take religion and psychology and philosophy and social science and English and history and all of those kinds of things. And, and I think that helped also because it sort of broadened my, my understanding of the world and all kinds of things. And as I look back, it was a good thing. It was not a, not a bad thing. I'm not sure I thought that way when I was 18 years old, <laughs> but, but now I do. So, so uh, Fred Haywood was very important in your early days there as far as influencing your career later on, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He, he was a classmate. We were in, in uh, school together. We were in most classes together. And, uh, as things happen, we, used, we sometimes double dated together and those kinds of things. And he was in my wedding and I was in his wedding. All of those kinds of things that happen when you have close friends, especially classmates in college. And he's, he's played a role. And One of the other people that I think uh, influenced me and I didn't realize how much until later was the health physicist. Uh, John Cure III was the health physicist at Babcock and Wilcox. And uh, he was a person that I, I got to know quite well. And, and he, again, was uh, one of those people who was very smart, uh, very technically competent. Uh, he was an operational kind of health physicist, uh, but he always did things correctly. I mean, there were no shortcuts to John. He knew the rules. He knew what needed to be done, and we did things in, uh, the way that they were supposed to be done. So he, he introduced me to health physics, uh, and I ultimately later in my life when I decided that was what I wanted to do with when I grew up. Uh, then I think looking back, John had a lot of uh, influence on me also. And well, how about this job? This job had started out one week at a time and then one month at a time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, was that your junior year that you were? It was the end of my <clears throat> junior year and the beginning of my senior year. Uh, the the uh, I played sports in college. I played soccer. and. Uh, the soccer season at Lynchburg was in the fall, and so the, the fall of my senior year, the Babcock and Wilcox actually gave me a leave. So it was sort of interesting to have a have a uh, part-time student <laughs> on leave so that they could play soccer. But after the season was over, I came back and uh, actually worked on the experiments for the uh, nuclear ship Savannah. We were uh, we we did what are called critical experiments. We built uh, from scratch, half size or quarter size, more likely, core reactor cores, and we did all the tests on them. Did they do a full prototype for the Savannah reactor? Yes. What, what, what we did was we did the experiments, the data go to the designers. In those days, the computers were not so good, and so uh, there was a lot of need for experimental information to, to put mm -hmm. into the data. And then when the core was designed and fabricated, and before it was shipped to, to uh, Camden, New Jersey to be installed on the Savannah, it was brought back to our lab. We assembled it and actually took it critical and made similar measurements to confirm the, the design and so forth. And then it was repackaged and shipped to New Jersey. And some of the people in, in the lab that worked with me actually followed the core and participated in the startup of the reactor on the ship. So. Now, at what point did you decide you wanted to get your reactor operator's license and your SRO, senior well, reactor's operator's license? It was, it was quite, quite early, probably in the early 
in 1960s, 61. Uh, that was sort of the thing to do. The, uh, the people that I worked with were uh, senior operators and uh, it was no normally expected that when you came on the staff that you would get that. So I got the reactor operator's license and then about two years later got the senior operator's license. Now, uh, at that point, you still thought that you wanted to be, I take it, a, uh, a, a reactor physicist of some kind. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, uh, I was having a wonderful time at Babcock and Wilcox because we had so many things going on and, and uh, associated with nuclear, nuclear energy. And I, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, serve aboard the Savannah in 1963 for... You know, tell us about that. That's a fascinating... Uh, uh, part of your life, I think. Really. Yes, it was. Uh, well, there were some labor troubles, and uh, here we have the first nuclear, the commercial nuclear ship, and uh, the, the unions on the ship. The uh, two, there were two unions: one for officers and one for the uh, for the uh, other people. And they basically walked off and left the ship tied to the dock in Galveston, Texas. So I was called. One of the people called into the office of the director of Babcock and Wilcox and said go to Galveston immediately and because the the Atomic Energy Commission had called and said send all your qualified senior operators to Galveston immediately and so within a couple of hours I was packing and on an airplane headed for uh, Houston and drove down to Galveston and reported the next morning uh, they brought the Coast Guard over from Mobile to take care of the ship and then Babcock and Wilcox supplied all the people responsible for the nuclear systems. So I spent three and a half months as a control room supervisor on the nuclear ship Savannah. Did and you go critical at that point? No, uh, the reactor was shut down it, uh, so it wasn't one of those situations where we had to operate the reactor and so forth but we we had a whole series of maintenance and, and emergency drills and all kinds of things that we had to do on a regular basis and we were working three shifts. There were uh, people uh, in the control room 24 hours a day, and we were running the reactor on what they called decay heat. We were just r running the systems to keep the reactor cool. Uh, but it was quite a learning experience for me. Uh, I took, uh, I had to learn the s ship and, and learn where things are, and it's not like a uh, regular nuclear power plant where s systems might be next to each other. They might be located in different compartments, even on different decks, because they fit them in wherever they can fit them. Uh, so it was, a, it was a fun time. It was a learning time. Uh, I, l I also learned I don't really like to work uh, shift work very much. <laughs> I don't think anybody does. <laughs> yeah. Now, how about radio fluent assessment? Did you, were you, that was, was that part of your responsibility also? Is the, the releases, the noble gas releases from the plant? Uh, there were, during that time, we had other people who were doing that. There were the health physics technicians were not union, and so they were, were not part of this union. So they were on, still on board. Uh, the Todd Shipyard supplied a lot of people, and so basically all all I had to do uh, in reality was to make sure that everyone else was doing what they were supposed to do. I I was pretty much tied to the control room. I had a list of things that had to be done, systems that had mm. to be checked, measurements that had to be made on a routine basis, and it was my, my job uh, as a supervisor just to make sure all of those things got done. How many effective full power hours had plan have on it anyway, roughly? I, I don't remember. I, got, I just didn't yeah. remember that it had a huge inventory. No, uh, it so didn't. It hadn't run that much. It, it went around, out, yeah. At that time, it hadn't. Uh, it, later it made you know world tours and so forth and it was a small reactor it was 68 megawatts uh, so it's a, a small reactor for in terms of generating power mm. but perhaps a large reactor in terms of, of uh, powering a ship and it was about 2100 shaft tor 21,000 shaft horsepower so it, it made a high speed so. yeah did well so so uh, w w what was your next assignment after this well, interestingly enough, uh, my friend Fred came into Fred Haywood came into into my life again one night uh, on the night shift. Uh, the phone rang and it was Fred Haywood, and he asked me the same question he asked me seven or eight years ago: "Do you want a job?" 
<laughs> so it's always nice to have friends. And, uh, and he was at Oak Ridge working in the health physics division, and they had just brought the health physics research reactor back from the Nevada test site where they were using it to simulate the nuclear weapons that were exploded over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the reactor was being operated by the neutron physics division uh, in, at Oak Ridge, and uh, the Fred's boss was John Alkseer. And John wanted a person that worked for him to be liaison between the operators and the health physicists and the radiobiologists and so forth that were uh, operating the reactor. So Fred called me since he knew I had an SRO license and, and asked me if I would be interested in a job. So I interviewed in October of 63 and reported to work in January of 64 working for John Oxier as the liaison between the experimenters and the uh, and the reactor operating crew. So, so again, a sort of a twist of uh, twist of fate uh, uh, put me uh, in uh, a situation that I hadn't really thought I would be in. So, so I worked in the health physics division even though I was a reactor operator. Uh, over the years, I got very interested in what was going on because I had to understand what the experimenters were doing and I had to communicate what the experimenters' desires were to the crew. And more, so more and more I got interested in health physics. And uh, one of the, in 1967, uh, early spring of 67, uh, uh, another person walked into my life, uh, a person by the name of Bill Chambers, uh, who was a retired captain in the, from the Navy and who was an associate professor at Georgia Tech. It's amazing because he was my boss later on at oh, AFRI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a wonderful person. He was. And uh, he came to use the reactor and in the passing I mentioned that I was interested in going to graduate school because I had now gotten really interested in health physics. And, and he simply responded, well, if you want to come to Georgia Tech, I have a I have a fellowship I will give you. And so I talked it over with my wife and we considered everything and, and uh, decided that was what we would do. So in September of 77, I went to Georgia Tech to begin work on my master's and with not fully uh, concluding that I was gonna go for my PhD, I just thought I would do my master's degree. And again, someone played a role. <laughs> well, wait, 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 what was the topic for your master's? Uh, at that time, Georgia Tech had a, what was called a non-thesis topic, so we, a non-thesis program. So we did a couple of research projects and wrote those up, but there was no thesis uh, per se at the master's level. But it was a health physics degree. Right. It was a health phys master's science in health physics. Uh, since I was on leave from the laboratory, I still was serving on a International Atomic Energy Agency Committee on dosimetry. And John Oxier called me and said, your committee is meeting in Vienna in December. And he gave me the dates. And I called back and told him that uh, that was the week of exams at Georgia Tech and I couldn't possibly go to the meeting. And he, he, he said, well, you have to go. So I didn't know what to do. So I went to my department head who was Lyle Roberts, Carlisle Roberts, who's very active in the society. And uh, I laid my problem on his desk and he said, well, just go see your professors and ask them to take your exams early. So I did. One of the people that I had a class from is a person that's well known to many people in the business and that's Ernest Savoglu. Oh, absolutely. So I was taking a class from Ernie Savoglu and, and in the process of telling him and talking with him, he asked me if, if I was going to go on for my PhD. I was in his class and I guess he had already made a decision as to my ability. And <clears throat> I told him no. I told him I was married, wife and three children. I'd come to get my master's and I was going to go back to Oak Ridge and, and continue working. And he basically told me in so many words that I can't repeat in polite company because if you know Savoglu, you know he was quite a salty person. And he told me that I was making a mistake, that I should really consider going on for my PhD. So he's the first person that ever gave any indication that 
that I should do that. So again, we started thinking about it, we started talking about it, and uh, made the decision to to do it. So I stayed on at Georgia Tech and got my uh, PhD as well. And uh, in that area, because I was so interested in external dosimetry because of the Hiroshima Nagasaki work that had been going on at Oak Ridge, I did my uh, uh, dissertation in neutron dosimetry. So it was a fun time, and uh, I'm you know, looking back, it was a, the right decision. And now, what, what, uh, what time was that vis-a-vis -vis the Henry Project? The Henry Project was 1967, uh, and uh, we actually went to uh, the desert, uh, to the Nevada test site in January. Why don't you explain what that is? Probably our viewers don't know. It's a well, very famous neutron experiment. Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the health physics research reactor had been used to simulate the nuclear weapons uh, over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and a follow-on experiment was to build a, uh, uh, an accelerator to produce 14 MeV neutrons and to make similar measurements uh, by putting this accelerator on the tower, uh, a, a 5,821 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, feet tall. Yeah, a quarter again higher than the Empire State right, Building. Higher than the I Empire State that. Building. <laughs> and uh, uh, simulate uh, 14 MeV neutrons and make measurements in, in uh, Japanese houses and in shelters and all kinds of things. So that experiment was... Uh, conducted began in January of 67 and there was a, a problem with the transformer of the accelerator and and so it was delayed uh, I mean it went on for a month and a half or so then the had transformer problems and so remember that was a giant Cockroft Walton wasn't it? yeah it's huge thing. I remember how big it was yeah. it was immense. yeah if you like that's an interesting story that uh, I played only a small role in, but it's a, an interesting thing that I tell my students because you should never, I think, take no for an answer, uh, at least without doing something to make sure that no is the right answer. Uh, Fred Haywood was, and John Oxier were in charge of the program. Fred was the technical director for the design of that accelerator. And he went to the engineers at uh, Oak Ridge and the uh, Y-12 facility and said, the, we need to cool this accelerator and the accelerator and the cooling system and everything has to fit into this elevator uh, car that is so big and it can't weigh more than a certain amount. And after studying the problem for a month or so, the engineers said it cannot be done. It's not possible to build a cooling system small enough and light enough to fit in that uh, elevator and and meet the requirements that you've set. Well, this is, you know, John Oxier was an early bird. He and I always got to uh, to the laboratory quite early in the morning because it was a good time to think. And uh, we were all disappointed with that news. But one morning, John was driving to to the laboratory probably at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. And he was thinking about this problem. And he realized that this internal combustion engine that was in his truck was removing lots of heat. And uh, as, as things happened in those days, we all had lunch together. And he brought this up, uh, that, that there must be a solution to this problem. We can't take no for an answer. And another person that's been very active in the Health Physics Society, Troy Troy Jones, who's a, an applied mathematician and also uh, uh, had s built stock cars and things in those days because he was a young, unmarried guy and was interested in that. He, we started scratching things out on a paper towel and he started making calculations and he concluded that John was right, that this could be done. And uh, so uh, several of the, our technicians went to the... Uh, salvage yard and got just a bunch of stuff and we actually built this entire system in the parking lot of our building and we to simulate the beam current of the of the accelerator we used five acetylene torches that put the basically the same amount of heat as the beam current would into the target and we made measurements got all the data took it to the engineers dropped it on their desk 
and said, yes, it can be done too. Mm -hmm. And then they built the machine and, and of course the Henry experiment went on for 13 months. So that was a, a situation where uh, experimentalists and, and others were not willing to take no for an answer, no for an answer. And, and it was a it was a team effort as I said I didn't play a big role in that but I certainly was there and, and participated but but it was basically because Fred and John and others w wouldn't take no for an answer and, and I try to pass those kinds of things on to my students because these are these are situations in which you just do do more and you make measurements and you and you learn from those so that's also we learned a lot about uh, tritium transport across the desert yes so we did <laughs> that's why i was out yes, there yes we did because <laughs> <So, Yeah. laughs> those were as member 5,000 carry tritium targets right huge were, targets the biggest targets that had ever been made yeah, yeah. and there was a big problem in, in target manufacturing and my boss at the time jim brennan got the idea from that for neutron therapy for anoxic tumors yeah from my telling him about the problems with the yeah. targets. And he said, well, I, I want 14 MeV. And so it's actually from that experiment that the AFRI, which yeah. was a classified accelerator, the largest beam current accelerator ever built, was uh, we, we just you know, walked on the giant shoulders of you all in, in building that uh, accelerator, which was the first one ever used uh, you know, for uh, neutron therapy for people. Yeah. But in, in any case, um, you were working with such incredible people, you know, Fred Haywood and John Alex here. And uh, what, was the, what was the next step? Uh, uh, you were in health physics, but, but yet you weren't quite in health physics. <laughs> well, uh, after, uh, after some period of time, the, the pioneers uh, in health physics, people like KZ Morgan and Walter Snyder, who were the, certainly the, the, the big names in our vision at, at uh, Oak Ridge were reaching retirement age and uh, so and so John Oxier was picked uh, to be the division director and uh, he um, began to look about uh, into the people in the lab as to who he wanted to be in in certain positions and so he asked me to and actually asked Troyce Jones we both went he asked us to move into the internal dosimetry section now here are guys, uh, two guys uh, who had worked only in external dosimetry uh, uh, and we were asked to sort of change fields, if you will. Uh, and so we went to, to work for Walter Snyder. Uh, Troyce, because of his uh, mathematics expertise mm -hmm. and uh, the, because we used a lot of Monte Carlo codes and other things that Troyce was quite familiar with. And I was uh, tagged to be the successor to Walter Snyder, that is to, I was going to be the section head after he retired. So I had about a year and a half to learn, and again, uh, the old-fashioned way. Dr. Snyder uh, concluded that if I was going to be the section head, then I had to do, know how to do everything. So that was my training. I, I, I had to do decay schemes. I had to learn how the decay schemes were done. I had to learn how to metabolic model was put together. I had to learn how to, the Monte Carlo codes were put together. And so he just moved me from task to task to task for, for a year and a half. What a and wonderful experience. Yeah, it was, but it was also, uh, some, of the, some of the things were very difficult. Mm -hmm. Was Mary Ford there at that point? Yes, Mary Ford and Mary Jane Cook and uh, people that have uh, since retired, and, uh, but they were all there. He had quite a group of people uh, and had been together for a long time. Well, I, I just identify him so closely with ICRP too. Right. Yes. Right. And uh, Walt, uh, Dr. Snyder was very, very good uh, person. He he accepted me uh, as his successor, and and he took me to committee meetings, the ICRP. He took me to uh, the the MERD committee. He was on the Medical Internal Radiation Dose Committee for the for the Society of Nuclear Medicine. And he took me to those meetings. And uh, ultimately, I was on the task group that uh, contributed to ICRP Publication 30, to all the calculations. and Which was a huge step forward, of course. Yeah. yeah. And when, uh, when he stepped down from the MERD committee, he arranged for me to take his place. So it was, uh, it was not, uh, it was a prearranged, and it was wonderful. He, he did 
such wonderful things for to help me along. So. And so you, you had, uh, when did you first start having input with ICRP itself? In the mid, uh, probably early to mid 70s. And how about NCRP? Because uh, all of these things you've been on for so long. Well, I had I served on a lot of writing groups for NCRP, but uh, it was not until this, the late 80s or, that I was finally elected to uh, to the main council. But the thing is, I saw your name many many years before that. Oh yes, yeah, I I, uh, I served on. Well, probably half a dozen writing groups and so forth, and contributed to those kinds of things. But uh, so, were the internal dosimetry was it? Yes, primarily. Although uh, I think uh, I, I still uh, love external dosimetry, and uh, I was on a writing group with uh, Marvin Rosenstein on on uh, external uh, dosimetry within the last five or six years. I, I was Joe Segg down there when you were down there at Oak Ridge? Yes. Yeah. Partial. Sometimes. Because yeah. he was one of the big external yeah. asymmetry people right. that influenced me yeah. greatly over the years. Yeah. He. I think he. Uh, well, I know he was officially at University of Kentucky. Uh, that was later. Later. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he was there part uh, early on. Because he started that the mixed chamber. Yeah. The gamma gamma neutron chamber technique right. was was his and. And in the early '60s, he taught us that at, yeah. at Afri. Yeah. And and uh, um, and I know you were interested in external as well right. as internal. Yeah. But in in any case, uh, so you started early with with uh, the uh, helping the various committees of the NCRP. Do you remember how early that is? I'm just trying to get an idea time-wise of when this happened. Uh, <laughs> it's been too many years. <laughs> too many yeah. Years. yeah. Yeah, well, that that was the nice thing about Oak Ridge in those days. The, we were encouraged to be involved. We were encouraged to give our time to these committees because it's all volunteer. It's all the efforts. Uh, uh, you don't. You don't. You, in some cases, they, or in most cases, they pay your travel. But other than that, the work that you you do is either at night or in sometimes you can steal some minutes during the day. And so, but. KZ and Walter and John Oxier, even when he became division director, you were always encouraged to, to be involved, to, to uh, contribute to the profession, to so forth. Now, speaking of contributing, at what point did you decide to give back by teaching? Oh, well, uh, in 19, I went to Georgia Tech in 1977 uh, to be a professor, associate professor, uh, and that was uh, something that I hadn't really considered uh, very much, although I guess it was uh, pretty clear to other people. Uh, for example, I'll tell you a little story about my wife and her insights into me. <laughs> uh, I had a call from Carlisle Roberts and said that uh, they had a position at Georgia Tech and, and that they hoped that I would be willing to consider it. And, and I told them that I would come for an interview and when I told my wife that I had arranged to go for an interview, and she said, why are you wasting their money? And I, and I said, what do you mean? And she said, you know that if they offer you a job, you're going to go. <laughs> so why go for an interview? <laughs> so she knew better than I did. She That's knew wonderful. better than I did that, I, that I, teaching was what I wanted to do. And you know, I had done some training, even back when Babcock and Wilcox uh, I'd been involved in education and training. We we had a, a two-year school at, at which, in conjunction with Lynchburg College, where we trained the operators, uh, the the engineering officers for the Savannah. They spent two years uh, in Lynchburg, and we we I was involved in the training then. So I just guess I didn't know uh, exactly what I wanted to do, but. But I can tell you it's been the most rewarding thing, the most rewarding decision I've ever made. It's just wonderful to, to be in the classroom, to work with young people. I think it keeps you young. I think it does, too. It's a real challenge, too. Yeah, yeah. It keeps one thinking, I believe. Right. But tell me about, about your students. And, and the, well, tell me about the topics that you enjoy teaching and, uh, and the students that you have. Well, the, have had. yeah. The, the, Obviously, the topic that I felt most qualified to teach when I went to Georgia Tech was internal dosimetry. 
it turned out even though Carl Morgan was on the faculty there when I went to Georgia Tech to be on the faculty, they didn't have a course in internal dose and dosimetry. So I put together a course on internal dosimetry that I taught for a number of years. Uh, I was really interested in external dosimetry. I've never really given up that. So we had research in thermoluminescent dosimeters and those kinds of things. And, and one of the things that I had always been interested in was trying to uh, provide experimental data that could be used to, to, I hate to use the word because I know Walter Steiner would would, if he were here, would object. I called it verifying the, in, the Monte Carlo calculations. And, but, so we had experiments. We built the phantoms, uh, and we made measurements inside the phantoms to relate to, to, uh, to provide experimental data that we could compare to our Monte Carlo results. So the research was, uh, was very, very interesting. I, I've had, I have no idea how many students I've had that uh, have passed through both Georgia Tech and Texas A&M, and certainly. The, when the, did you get associated with the Texas A&M? I went there in 1985 as a professor. Um, they had a health physics program. They wanted to make it larger, and uh, the they had one professor on the staff at that time. His name was Richard Neff, who was uh, uh, prominent in the health physics society uh, many years ago. He was a biophysicist, actually. And he uh, had a heart attack and passed away. So uh, they actually hired two people to replace him. Uh, uh, Milton McLean, who who's a, became the radiation safety officer at Texas A&M, and then I was hired also. And so Milton and I worked together to, to build that program. Milton had an appointment as a professor in the department, and I had an appointment. So there were two of us. and. Uh, we worked with the other faculty to make the program better. So, in terms of students, I've just had so many, and they're all over the world. I mean, not just uh, uh, not just uh, in the U.S. The first person that jumps to mind because he's so prominent now in the society is Mike Michael Ryan. Mike Mike did his Ph.D. with me at Georgia Tech after uh, doing his bachelor's and master's with Ken Scrabble at University of Lowell. Uh, but I have a lot of uh, people working in power plants. Uh, some PhDs, uh, Frank Sakaris came from Oak Ridge and did his PhD with me. Uh, Paul Frame was a student of mine at, at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, and he still blames me for getting him into health physics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, he, but he's uh, certainly prominent in the society. Uh, I have students, many students in Taiwan uh, and the uh, Institute for Nuclear Energy Research. Uh, 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 in fact, the uh, the, der the uh, chairman of the Atomic Energy Council in uh, in Taiwan w was a uh, former student of mine. So, uh, now, I understand that you're teaching in Germany these days. You want to tell me a little bit about how you got into that? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, well. The College of Engineering started a, what we call a study abroad program, and the initial campus that was start, started was outside of Paris. Uh, they made the decision of three, four, three years ago, four years ago, that they wanted to have two campuses and established a second one in Germany. And they asked me if I would be the director of that program. So for about two months, uh, July and August, and in, in the summer, we take Texas A&M students, engineering students, to Germany and to France. And we teach engineering courses there for which they get credit uh, toward their degree. So we, we teach some technical courses. We teach uh, ethics, which is a, a very nice course. I happen to teach that. And, and we also have courses in German language and culture. And we spend our time either in the class or we take technical or cultural tours uh, throughout throughout Germany. Well, that's a wonderful, diverse thing that you're doing, isn't it, these days? Well, I think so. It's, it's uh, extremely rewarding for me. Uh, the students get, uh, get exposed to another culture. They, uh, most of them, if not all of them, say that that experience has, has changed their life. They uh, see things differently. 
we could because we have students who perhaps never been out of Texas much less out of the United mm -hmm. States and, and uh, they go over and they they get to see a different culture and they're allowed to travel on their own uh, certain times uh, during the during the two months and uh, and we force feed them some things <laughs> But uh, we also expose them to things that they perhaps because of their their major, uh, perhaps they're a petroleum engineer or a mechanical engineer, and they might not see. Uh, but we take them t to nuclear power plants and pump storage facilities and hydro facilities and solar and geothermal and, and wind farms and, and just er uh, even to one of my favorite places is to take them to... Uh, a facility that makes transformers and I didn't know until I started taking students there that these huge transformers are still made by hand the, uh, and by the Germ the Germans make them by hand they mm. have these huge machines but uh, everything is done by men who are craftsmen and it's just unbelievable wow so, so it's it's a quite a rewarding time for me and I, now John when did you first become a uh, uh, a member of the Health Physics Society. That was really early on. Well, I do remember that uh, when I made the commitment to uh, go to Georgia Tech and, and uh, <clears throat> become a, a student and, and pursue my master's degree, I actually joined the society. So I joined it in 1967. Up until that time, I'd been um, primarily a member of the American Nuclear Society. Uh, I joined uh, because that was what I thought I wanted to do. <clears throat> but that was my first meeting. Uh, I believe it was in Washington, D.C., and I joined the society in early 67 and, and attended the annual meeting in uh, in uh, Washington, is my recollection. My wife and I were there, and Professor Chambers was kind enough to tell me at that meeting that everything was set, and then in September I'd be in school. So that oh, was, wow. uh, so I've been been a member a long time. You certainly have. And, and when did you first take your first committee appointment? Do you remember that? Because I've been on so many of them over the years. Uh, it's, it's, I think my, yeah, I, I, I don't well, when, when did you join the board? I know that was well, later. Well, I, I was secretary for two years in the, in the 70s, late 70s. And uh, so, so uh, when you're secretary, you serve for two years and then you have a, uh, and you're also on the board, and then you have a third year as the sort of the past secretary to make the new, to help the new secretary make the transition. So I was on the board for three years, or I think 1974 to 77, somewhere in that time frame. Perhaps I should have boned up on all these dates. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that important, but the thing is, I just wanted to get a sense of it. And then, uh, and then, when did you become uh, president elect? 1984, I was president elect. And that's a lot of work, isn't it? Yes, it's a lot of work. Uh, David Waite, uh, well, the president before me was Jim Watson, and the, pre uh, the president elect when I was uh, president was David Waite. And, uh, when I turned over the gavel to him, uh, uh, actually the next year, when I turned over the gavel to him at the at the meeting, I told him that I was so tired that I, what I'd like to do is crawl under the podium and take a long nap. And, <laughs> and uh, the next year, the next year, uh, when David turned over the gavel, he said he didn't understand what I meant a year ago, but today he did. <laughs> so, so it's a lot of work. And, uh, I actually, tra I think I traveled almost as much as, as the past president. Uh, I, you still have an opportunity to represent the society. It's a three-year commitment. Uh, the president-elect uh, does most of the traveling, and the, but uh, it, it was it was three years of interesting stuff. I got to meet a lot of people. I got to. I think the president-elect's year is very important because you get to visit the chapters and you get to understand the various uh, situations that people find themselves and you see that the chapters are different, they have different needs and they have, uh, have different goals and so forth. And so you, you really have a much, much better feel for, the, for the, how the society, the, mm. the members of the society are when you finish that year. 
if you can survive it. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah it's, it's a huge commitment in time and energy right. that, that I think most members of our society don't really realize uh, what you're asking the president-elect and president to do. Yeah. Uh, well, I was very lucky that I was at Georgia Tech. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I was not at Georgia Tech. I, I had just gone to Texas A&M, and uh, they, the university, uh, the dean and the College of Engineering encouraged those things, so I was very fortunate to be given uh, time to do that. And uh, it, so it made it easier. Uh, yeah, I think in other situations, it, it can be difficult trying to arrange your schedule and so forth and, and conduct your, your normal job, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Now, the, the profession of health physics has seen many changes uh, since your early days in it, uh, and it's changing rapidly now as, as we speak. Uh, and you have a perspective that I think is unique among health physicists because of the many areas of expertise you're, you, you've been uh, fortunate enough to be able to bring uh, uh, to the profession and to your students. Where do you see in the future the, uh, the profession going and, and uh, what advice do you have for the viewers of this tape as far as, as uh, the future of health physics and the general profession? Well. Uh, there's no question that the profession has changed. I th I, you just said that, but I, I would agree completely. And some of the people who are my age or uh, have found that health physics is no longer fun because uh, they tend to, uh, they seem to have been caught up in all the regulations and all the documentation and so forth. But I still, uh, I still would tell people if you like to solve problems, if you like a different problem every day, if you like variety, if you if you don't want to do the same thing every day, then health physics is is what is uh, a good choice because it is a problem solving profession. It is a profession where you have to have a certain amount of personality because you have to deal with people who perhaps on one hand are technically oriented and don't believe they need your help or don't need your advice or don't need your guidance. And you have, on the other hand, you have people who uh, uh, represent the general public who don't understand radiation and so forth. And, and those are challenges. Uh, you know, uh, when I went to Georgia Tech uh, many years ago, as a professor, I was, they asked me to give a seminar. And, and I gave a seminar, and since it was for the students, I tried to make it light, and I had some jokes and so forth. And one of the students came up after the seminar and said, Dr. Poston, uh, in order to be a health physicist, do you have to be a stand-up comic? <laughs> <laughs> and, and my response was, uh, no, but it sure does help sometimes. <laughs> See? And so you have to, to me, that's a challenge, and that makes it fun. Because uh, if you're dealing with the public, you have to take technical things and bring them into a vocabulary that they can understand. If you're dealing with technical people who don't think they need your help, you, you have a different challenge. Uh, and then you talk about how to measure this and, and how to measure that and, and designing experiments and so forth. It's just, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's just a wonderful profession. And I've, you know, I have, I've chosen not to retire because I'm still enjoying what I'm doing. That's wonderful because yeah. you're contributing incredibly. Well, you have quite a heavy teaching load still, don't you? Yes, I'm still teaching two courses a semester and uh, two in the summer. So I'm uh, probably teaching more than I ever have. Wow. But I enjoy it. And now, what do you see as the biggest challenge to the health physics profession in the future? Well, I think it's still communication. You know, the, the homeland security and all these concerns about terrorists are... Uh, give us an opportunity to uh, to talk more with the public and uh, we spend a lot of time talking to ourselves and preaching to the choir as they say and, and what we really need to do is get out and talk to the people answer their questions uh, those kinds of things and we've tried to do a lot of that here in Texas we the South Texas chapter and the North Texas chapter have both been very active with uh, fire uh, firemen police emergency response people because they need uh, someone who will speak to them and at, 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 uh, help them understand. So I think to me that's the immediate challenge in the society. 
Um, in terms of uh, speaking about teaching for a minute, I guess that's why I like health physics. Is you've already said it; it's continually changing. You know, if the ICRP and the NCRP and the federal regulations and so forth. So uh, you have to you're continually challenged to keep up with what's going on. What are the new developments in dosimetry? What are the new regulations? What are the new recommendations? What are the new models? What, what's the new uh, transport code? All of those kinds of things. And you can, you can exist in the past, but uh, the challenge is to keep up. And, and I think, to me, that again makes it interesting. You know, I'm learning all the time. You, know, you, you don't stop learning. And uh, as long as you approach things that way, it makes it fun. So. So I've been fortunate. My, uh, I've enjoyed everything I've done, and I never influenced my children uh, to become health physicists. But two of them are. Uh, my my daughter has a master's in health physics. My son has a PhD, a certified health physicist. And I look at where they started. They didn't want to be. They didn't come in my direction. They never asked me you know, to. Should they be a health physicist? But they saw that I was having a good time, and both of them uh, were drawn, I guess, to the field because they saw, hey, this looks like fun. And so I'm, I'm proud that they are, but I really didn't push them. Uh, I didn't try to dissuade them, but I didn't try to bring them into health physics. I let them make their own decisions, and I guess because I was having fun, they were influenced heavily by that. <laughs> so. Well, the society is uh, indeed fortunate to have you as uh, as a, a one of our leading uh, members and a professor, a teacher, and a person who's uh, I think enthusiasm for the profession is so infectious. Thank That's you. the thing that I've uh, admired about you over the years is is that you, you actually radiate this uh, uh, this this enthusiasm. And on, the, on behalf of the History Committee, I want to thank you so much for spending some time and uh, telling us about your amazing career. And I hope that this is a tape that will, uh, I'm sure it will be a tape that will influence a lot of youngsters to come into our profession over the years. So, John, Happy to thank do you it. very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed this.